Hey guys, Will here. Now today we have in front of us Track Racers TR120 aluminium profile cockpit as well as their GT style seat. Now those of you who have watched one of our cockpit reviews before would know in addition to the overall experience of putting one of these things together, there are three things that we like to look for in a cockpit. Adjustability, expandability and rigidity. So we're going to be looking at all three things in detail today and by the end of today's video you should have a good picture of whether the Track Racer TR120 is the cockpit for you. So let's get started. So as always, before we get started here, a couple of quick housekeeping things for those who might be new to the channel. So firstly, thank you very much to Track Racer for sending this gear across to us to check out today. Now, those of you who have seen our Track Racer TR160 review about 18 months ago now, would have seen that we we're actually quite critical of a couple of elements of that overall experience from the assembly instructions through to some of the elements of the design as well. Now, I can tell you already having built those things that a lot of improvements have been made in that regard, and that's definitely something that we'll be looking at today. But I wanted to let you guys know, first and foremost, we haven't had any words put in our mouth we are completely free to say whatever we want about this product and uh, yeah as always we'll be completely open and honest with you and I'm happy to say that we did actually see some significant improvements to the TR160 design over time based on a lot of the feedback that we were able to provide through our review process as well as a lot of the comments that were shared on those videos too so it's good to see that Track Racer do listen to that feedback they do take that on board and as always if you're watching this and you do happen to already own a TR120 let us know what your experience was like down in the comments as well that's always a really valuable part of any review video allows the audience to see real world customer experience as well as our own opinion. So if you do decide you want to pick one of these up or any other Track Racer products, we do have some links down in the description which are a great way of helping us out with the channel and we do have a nice little discount code there for you guys as well if you are wanting to pick one of these up. So definitely check that out down in the description. So let's fast forward back now to the very start of this experience from receiving the boxes. Now one of the things that you'll notice with Track Racer is that you do receive the cockpit in multiple different boxes depending on the configuration that you order as well. So accessories will obviously be packaged separately, seat comes separately, various components of the rig will also come shipped separately as well. Now in our case, we received about 14 separate boxes that included the various different accessories as well. So that has its advantages and disadvantages. Obviously one of the advantages is if you do live in an apartment building or somewhere where you've got a lot of steps to get up to, it means that each individual box is obviously going to be a little bit lighter. That definitely can help. On the flip side to that, of course, it does have the disadvantage of making things potentially a little bit more confusing as you're unboxing and it also does open up the potential for things to go missing in shipping. Now, unfortunately, that is one thing that did occur for us. It occurred with the TR160 review that we did 18 months ago. And we have heard quite a bit of feedback from you guys in the community as well with regards to missing components with inboxes as well as missing boxes. We do know that it is something that Track Racer are working on improving. But unfortunately, when putting together the TR120, we did find that we not only had a missing box entirely, the pedal plate components were missing, but we also did have a couple of missing parts inside one of the boxes too. So one thing that I would recommend you do is do a bit of a stock take before you actually put this together just so you're not going to run into any snags along the way. I know a lot of people don't have a dedicated space to build stuff like we do here in the studio and you don't want to get all set up and then find you've got something missing halfway through. Now another thing I would highly recommend you do is print off your order sheet or your picking list from your order and go through each individual listed box make sure that you have all the boxes there. Obviously that's not going to let you know whether there's any missing components within the boxes but it's at least a start. Now one thing that I really do hope Track Racer do moving forward is actually label the boxes individually a little bit more clearly. Now they do have individual part numbers on them, but those part numbers can be a little bit cryptic. So say for example, you're looking for your handbrake mount, instead of having written on the box universal handbrake mount, it has written on the box TR80HB4. So it's kind of a little bit cryptic there. You don't really know what you're looking at. So what I would recommend once again is having a look at your order sheet, going through the individual part numbers and then marrying them up to the item descriptions on the picking sheet and then actually writing those descriptions on the boxes. In our experience, that makes the assembly process a little bit more straightforward because it means you're only opening the boxes that you need as you go and you don't just have a wash of bits and pieces everywhere. Kind of like when you're building something out of Lego, you don't want to open every single bag all at once. You just want to open the bags that are relevant to what you're building at that point in time. So you can kind of think of it like a giant Lego set in that regard. But overall, build process is very straightforward. I'm very happy to say that the instructions have been massively improved since we did the TR160 build. That was something that I was really happy to see. So I'm really happy to see that those efforts haven't been wasted. And I did spend a little bit of time before filming this going back through their website, checking some of the documentation for some of the older products and you know just checking to see whether those had been improved as well. And they appear to have been in most cases at least. So definitely a big step forward for Track Racer there. 
Now, another thing that I was happy to see as well was improvements in terms of the individual packaging of components, particularly when it comes to the aluminium profile itself. They're wrapping it in a sort of plastic membrane kind of material now, which does do a better job at protecting the material itself. Obviously, anytime you have metal to metal contact, you are gonna end up with marks. So having each component individually wrapped was definitely an improvement over what we had with the TR160 18 months ago as well. One thing that I was a little bit disappointed with was that there was still quite an abundance of metal shavings inside the package. Now, obviously that is just a byproduct of when they're sawing the individual pieces of aluminum profile, but I would recommend you unbox this either outdoors or on a hard surface, not on carpet, because you will end up with metal filings all over your carpet and it can be quite difficult to vacuum out, can get stuck in there and uh, you know be a bit of a hassle. So it's not a massive problem. It certainly was improved over our experience with the TR160 previously, but still not quite up to the standard that we've seen with some other aluminum profile cockpits that we have reviewed in the past. So in terms of the assembly process itself, I'm happy to say that other than the inconvenience of those missing components, which was quickly rectified in our case, but obviously, you know, given that we are professional reviewers here, we do have a large audience. Obviously our experience isn't necessarily indicative of the real world customer experience when it comes to dealing with those kinds of issues. So again, we definitely recommend you guys do your own research there. Have a look at the general vibe around Track Racer. Have a look at some of the feedback there. And again, if you have had an experience with Track Racer products, let us know down in the comments as well to help the audience out there. But look, in our case, the uh, the missing parts were sent out to us the very next day. We received them within a couple of days and we were good to get up and running again. But look, in terms of the instructions, everything was very easy to follow, nice and modular. Everything was clearly illustrated and it really didn't, there was no sort of head scratching moments at all in the assembly of this one, which I was really happy with. Now, obviously we do have quite a lot of experience putting together aluminum profile cockpits now, but kind of looking at it from an outside perspective, it wasn't really any point in the process where I could imagine that I would have felt stuck or like I didn't know what the hell I was doing at any point throughout the build process. So there are a couple of little best practices when it comes to putting together an aluminum profile cockpit. Uh, we have a dedicated video, which I would highly recommend you guys watch some of my top tips for assembling any aluminum profile cockpit, and that is gonna save you a bunch of time. Now, the most important thing is that you pick yourselves up one of these. I'll put a link down in the description below. This is an adjustable set square with an inbuilt spirit level. And this is an almost essential tool for making sure that everything is symmetrical within your build. Basically, what you do on one side, you measure, and then you replicate on the other side, and that makes sure that everything is lined up. It's very much a case of taking the time to make sure that everything is perfect down to the nearest millimeter at least, just saves you a lot of hassle later on down the track. If things are a little bit out of alignment, things are a little bit twisted, then just things don't quite line up properly. And I'm sure that a large percentage of people that get in touch with customer service because they think that something's broken or misaligned on their rig, maybe holes in the wrong spot. In actual fact, it's just that they haven't aligned things correctly when they're putting it together. And I know this from personal experience because we actually ran into this exact issue when I was putting together the TR160. We found that the holes didn't appear to be in quite the right place on the seat. And what we found is that it was actually that the brackets were slightly misaligned and it was throwing everything else out and making everything wonky. So a little bit of extra time making sure that everything is millimeter perfect and symmetrical in your build process is going to save you a lot of time and hassle in the long run. Definitely recommend you check out that video above my head now and linked down in the description. But Otherwise, very simple to put together. So I really just don't see the need to run you through the entire assembly process here step by step because there really wasn't any major traps or anything that kind of had me scratching my head. And overall, quite a rewarding and enjoyable experience. What I will do now is hop up, take you through some of the design elements of the TR120, some of the things that make it unique, some of the things that I like, some of the things that I maybe don't like so much. And uh, yeah, we can get stuck into all the details. Okay, so good opportunity now to run you through the basic hardware configuration that we have here because we do have a couple of options and a couple of accessories mounted. So we'll run through pricing and all those various different bits and pieces. So the TR120 cockpit as it sits uh, comes in at 859. We're gonna be talking Australian dollars here because it's an Australian company, but obviously check for your local distribution center to see what the price is there. Uh, so 859 for the uh, configuration that we have here. Uh, that can drop down to 829 depending on the wheel mount that you have. So this is the front facing fanatic mount that we have here. We also do have the option for a plate style mount like this, which is compatible with pretty much every wheelbase, at least every mainstream wheelbase on the market, but you can see their website for the full list of compatibility. So that is an option. You also have the option for a front mount to fit a mid style or semi cube style motor too. So that can bolt straight onto the nose of the motor like so. And you'll notice the spacing here and the spacing on the Fnatic mount and the spacing on the other mount as well are all exactly the same width. So the cool thing about that is that they're literally interchangeable. You just take one out and drop the other one in 
and it all bolts in in place. So really cool that design. I, uh, I much prefer that to the design that we saw with the front mounted plates back when we reviewed the TR160. Now this is a universal mounting system. It's called the TR1 system. So you can buy these wheel mounts as an option for your TR160 or your TR120. So 859 as it comes configured here. That doesn't include the seat, the seat rails or the seat uh, side mounts. So the seat that we have here is the GT style fixed fiberglass seat. That comes in at 399. Uh, the seat brackets, which is these mounting brackets on the side here, those come in at 49. The slider, which you see underneath there as well, a Sparco style slider, that is another 49. So then we also have a couple of additional accessories mounted here. So we have the optional handbrake mount that comes in at $39. Then we have the shift amount, which is this part here, plus the profile connecting here. So by default, the TR120 doesn't come with any of this part, basically from here back and down here. That's all part of the shift amount. That is universal between sides as well, so you can mount it on either left or right. That comes in at 115 Australian dollars. And that is pretty much everything as we have configured here. We're not gonna talk about the caster wheels. They are an optional accessory too. We just bought them so we could move the rig around a little bit more easily. So if you are wanting to wheel the rig around, you can look at those, but we don't really need to include it as part of the configuration here because it's not really a, uh, a necessary thing for most people, I wouldn't say. So as it stands, the configuration here minus the caster wheel upgrade comes in at 1,510 Australian dollars. Obviously add shipping to that as well. To ship from them in Melbourne to us here up near Sydney is about 50 $50, $60, but obviously that will vary depending on whereabouts you are in the world. So you're looking at around about $1,500 Australian dollars, obviously adding shipping on top of that, depending on where you are in the world. Now, if we compare that to a couple of relatively close competitors in the market, Next Level Racing have just released their new GT Elite, not to be confused with the FGT Elite, so a little bit less adjustability. Now, we reviewed the FGT Elite quite recently. We're pretty impressed with that. We actually have the GT Elite sitting right over there, which we're gonna be reviewing right after this guy. So if we compare the GT Elite, that does come with free shipping in Australia. Obviously, again, depending on where you are in the world, that will vary. So if you look at the GT Elite, that comes in at $8.99, and then you need to add in the cost of a seat on top of that. So the equivalent to this seat would be their ERS1 seat, and that is $4.99. So that takes the total to $1,398. So around about $100 less than what we have here for a relatively equivalent configuration. And obviously, when we review that cockpit a little bit further down the track, we will do a bit of a direct comparison between the two to let you know which we think is the better value, in our opinion. Then we have something like the Simlabs P1X cockpit, which is pretty much the benchmark cockpit these days when it comes to aluminium profile, at least. Now, Simlab is a European company, so pricing is gonna vary here. As, as it stands right now at the time of making this video, the conversion brings it to about 1,300-ish Australian dollars. Uh, and then obviously you need to factor in shipping on top of that as well. When I bought mine, I didn't have much change from about two and a half grand with all the accessories and bits and pieces that I bought. So quite a bit more expensive to get here in Australia, but obviously depending on where you are in the world, that will vary. And then you'll need to factor in the cost of a seat on top of that. Now, I would generally recommend try and buy a seat locally simply because they are big and bulky. They cost a fortune to ship. In fact, my seat that I bought, my RCC seat for my main rig, cost as much to ship as it did for the actual seat itself, which was ridiculous. So three relatively closely matched products in terms of price, at least. It's gonna be interesting to see how they compare in terms of functionality. So not all aluminium profile cockpits are created exactly the same as each other, even though a lot of them do look very similar in appearance. There's only so many different creative things you can do when it comes to profile to make it look unique. But what I wanted to do here is run you through some of the things that do stand out to me and some of the differences between some of the different brands that we've looked at here. So when we did our TR160 review, uh, we had a bit of a look at the differences between the profile that came with the Simlabs P1X and the profile that came with the TR160. Now what I want to do is the same thing again pretty much here just to run you through because there are a couple of changes, a couple of things I've noticed different about the TR120 to the TR160 that we reviewed about 18 months ago now. So I don't know whether they've changed that. I'm sure they'll comment down below and let us know. But this is a piece of profile. This is a piece of 40 by, uh, by 80 from our Simlabs P1X cockpit. And this is a piece of 40 by 80, which came with the TR120 that we're looking at today. Now the numbers, what they mean is 40 millimeters by the length. So these are 40 by 80, if you have a look at a piece like this, it's 40 by 40, you've got 40 by 120, which would be three channels wide. And then this particular cockpit doesn't utilize it, but you can also find 40 by 160, which I actually have on our Simlabs P1X. Now, what you'll notice here, this is the Simlabs P1X profile, nice and thick internally here, so it's got quite a solid structure internally. You can see the 40 by 80 that we get with the Track Racer cockpit is a little bit narrower 
in some of these areas. Now, in our experience, this doesn't make any real world difference in terms of flexing the cockpit at the kind of weight levels that we're working with here. We will definitely be testing out this cockpit a little bit later on down the line with some motion systems. So we'll let you know whether we do encounter any flex or anything like that. But at the weight levels that we're dealing with with a human being sitting in the seat, I, it, at least in our experience, we haven't had any issues. And if we have a look at the two pieces of 40 by 40 side by side, again, this is a seat rail from the Simlabs P1X cockpit. And this is a seat rail as we got with the uh, TR160. And you can see the massive difference there. Now we didn't find that the seat rails did have any noticeable flex in them with the TR160, even with this really thin profile. But if we come down and have a look down here, you can see the 40 by 40 that they're including with the TR120 is actually thicker again. So that is what we got with the TR160. And that is what we had with the Simlabs P1X. So TR120, Simlabs P1X, and TR160. So again, we didn't find any actual real world difference at the weight levels that we're working with. I'm about 85 kilograms, and yeah, it wasn't a problem at all, but I did just wanna point that out and clarify that for you guys. And then if we have a look at the 40 by 120 and compare that to the 40 by 80, again, both pieces of profile, which were included with the TR120, you can see, again, the 40 by 120, is a little bit thicker again there just to give it that little bit of extra rigidity. And again, we haven't noticed any real world difference, but it is what it is, so I thought it was important to just show you that. Now, the other difference here as well is in the little T-nuts which we get to fasten everything. So these are the types of T-nuts that we get included with the TR120 and of course with the TR160 as well, which we reviewed a little while ago. So what we have here is essentially just a little spring leaf. And what that does is it allows the T-nut to sort of spring up against the back of the profile there. You can see it gives it a little bit of tension on the back and that holds it in place so it doesn't just fall straight to the bottom when we're putting them in. Now, what that means is that it's a lot easier to mount accessories and bits and pieces after the event because you can imagine if you're trying to mount an accessory and the T-nuts are just dropping down, that is gonna be a bad time. Now, what we have with these is the ability to also slot them in from the side so you can just kind of pop it in and then spin it around with your fingers like that. Now then, with the TR160, we had all sorts of troubles actually getting the T-nuts in. We found probably about 60, 70% of the time, we weren't able to actually get them in through the channels like this. We had to take a piece off and slide it in from the side, which was a real pain. You can imagine if you're building a cockpit like this, you've assembled everything, and then you wanna get T-nuts in to mount an accessory, you don't wanna have to pull the entire rig apart, well, at least a portion of the rig apart every single time to get a T-nut in. Now, I'm assuming they must have changed suppliers or something like that with their T-nuts since we did the TR160 review because we didn't run into a single instance where we weren't able to slot these T-nuts in from the side very easily. So that was definitely something that changed the experience. It made it a lot more enjoyable and a lot less frustrating to put the TR120 together. Now, if we compare that again to what we get with the Simlabs P1X cockpit, that comes with these spring ball type loaded T-nuts. And they essentially achieve exactly the same thing. They slot in. They lock you into place on the side there, so the little ball bearing is spring-loaded, and it just pops into place. Now these do slide around a little bit more easily. One thing you will notice is that they kind of tend to roll along the channels, whereas these ones tend to scrape along the channels. So if you've got something like this piece, for example, where you've got six T-nuts that are actually holding in place, when you loosen that off, it actually kind of grinds along the profile and does have a tendency to scratch it internally, although you probably aren't gonna be able to see that in most cases, so it's not really a problem. But what we have found is that the rollerball type ones do move along the channels a little bit more easily after the event. So about the same to install now. Maybe these ones are a little bit easier, but you know, at, once you've got everything up in place and everything's bolted in and you're not moving anything anymore, they both achieve exactly the same thing. But again, just a little subtle difference there between what you get with Simlabs cockpits versus what you get with Track Racer. So I thought it was important to point that out. Now, in terms of bracketry, things like that, most aluminum profile cockpits will include some sort of an angle bracket like this. This is used at various different areas. So if we come around the side here, you can see these are being used to lock our seat platform rail in place. So basically we just have two of these. We have a T-nut in each side and that just bolts in place. Now, a lot of cockpits just use these pretty much throughout. You can see with Track Racer, they've used a couple of different types of brackets and bits and pieces around here. So we've got these angle brackets here, which are a nice solid three channel type arrangement. You can see they've used the same thing if we have a look around the back here as well on the edges here. And that just holds things a little bit more rigid 
than if you were using three of these in place. And it also makes things a little bit easier as well because you can see these angle brackets have these little tabs on them and they lock into place in the channels so they don't rotate, but they don't fit if you rotate them around this way. So you have to actually snap those little tabs off, which again, isn't a problem, but it is a bit of a pain to have to do. So I actually quite like the inclusion of these angle brackets. It just makes putting things together that little bit easier. And you might also be wondering if we're having a look down here, what the deal is with this funny bracket here. Now you can see it kind of waves in and it goes from 620 millimeter diameter on the outside here to 580 diameter internally here. Now this is actually the same width at this point as a Simlabs P1X for those who might be wondering. So what that allows them to do is a couple of different things. So it makes it a lot cheaper to ship because you can imagine if they're shipping long pieces of profile, they've got to have a big heavy box. So splitting it up into two separate sections means it's a bit cheaper to package, a little bit cheaper to ship as well. So that makes a difference. Having a wider base here at the back also gives you a little bit more side to side stability as well. That's the reason why the feet actually come out from the edges like that too. It just gives you a bit wider stance and a bit more stability in that sense. So we'll make it a little bit more tricky for those who are wanting to mount uh, motion systems. Uh, if you're using a four actuator type system, generally speaking, you wanna have those in a perfect square. So you can imagine if you have four actuators and they're not mounted in a perfect square, what's gonna happen is when you send the signal to go to the side, for example, it's gonna dip down at the front a little bit more than it does at the back, simply because of the offset. So when we test this out with a motion system a little bit down the line, we'll definitely let you know whether we run into any issues with that. But it also just gives it that kind of unique look to it as well. So it's gonna be interesting to see whether we do get any flex in this. What they have done recently is include some new brackets, basically just to give a little bit of extra reinforcement here as well. Uh, one of the things we did notice is that when we're doing up these brackets here, the included, where is it? The included Allen key, this guy, isn't quite long enough to get in there and tighten like this. So you have to go in like that, which obviously means you have less leverage on the Allen key. So it would have been good to see them include a slightly longer Allen key just to get a little bit more leverage on those screws. Hopefully with those brackets included there, we don't get any flex or twist here, but that's definitely something that we will be having a look at. But subjectively, of course, I think this actually has a really classy look to it. I love that all the hardware pretty much entirely other than just the red brackets here is all black, a little bit of branding here and there, but not over the top. And uh, yeah, I just, I, I love that all the angle brackets, all of those bits and pieces are all black as well. So it all kind of just ties in and looks really classy. The pedal plate as well, I really like this design. Uh, there are a couple of different pedal plate style designs that you can choose from depending on your preference. And those are compatible with other track racer aluminum profile cockpits too. So you can kind of choose which one's gonna suit your style. This particular one here I really like because it uses aluminum profile for the rear and front support. So you get the added thickness here of the 40 millimeter struts across to kind of give you that rigidity as you're pushing down the pedal. So what you would do is bolt your pedals directly onto this profile or bolt your uh, whatever pedal plate you had that came with your pedals directly to that. And then you have this integrated heel plate here which has another piece of 40 by 40 profile running through the center here as well. Now, one of the observations we had with the TR160 cockpit that we reviewed, which had the other style uh, pedal plate, that was a single piece of metal which basically ran across the top here. And what we found is that when we pushed on the pedals, it did have quite a bit of bend in the middle. So it would kind of flex in from the side when you put that pressure on here. And what we suggested to them, what they actually ended up doing was adding a couple of reinforcement beams across underneath, almost like a strut bar going across the uh, towers on a car to just make it that little bit more, little bit more rigid. They sent us across a revised version of that pedal plate and it wasn't absolutely perfect, but it did definitely improve the, uh, the overall amount of flex that we had. So it's going to be really interesting to see how this performs by comparison, but I really like this design because it's nice and easy to work with. It goes together easily. It's really adaptable in terms of being able to mount a lot of different types of pedals, but it also has a lot of adjustability here too. So you can see we've got two screws in on the side here. You can loosen those on either side. That allows you to move in and out your profile on the rear. You can also loosen the screws here as well. So that's gonna allow you to move this piece of profile. So that means you have adjustability between the channels on the rear and the front. That means that you're gonna be able to adapt that to pretty much any type of pedal which can bolt directly to the profile. You can also move this across into the front channel here too if you need even more spacing. And then the heel plate you can see has some slots cut out on the top too. So you're gonna be able to move that in and out to pretty much accommodate for anything that I can imagine. We'll probably end up using the Husingville Ultimate Plus pedals for the review. Uh, just because they, you know, they do have a really solid load cell. So we are going to need to put quite a bit of pressure into them to really sort of test this out and see whether there's any flex. But then underneath here as well, you can see we've got a bunch of channels cut out 
which is going to allow us to adjust the angle of the pedal plate independent of the rest of the chassis too. Now the way these little levers here work, this is quite cool too. So it's almost like a ratchet system. So you pull the lever out, you spin it back around to where you need it, and then you can turn it again. And same with tightening. You just tighten, ratchet, tighten, ratchet, tighten. And that works really nicely. So a lot more convenient than having to go grab an Allen key and sort of fumble around underneath it. Really great to see that they've included things like that. Little, little details like that really do make a big difference, not only when it comes to assembly, but just in general usage when you're wanting to put different pedals on or if you're wanting to adjust to a different driving style. You know, those little things do make a difference and they do make it a more enjoyable product to use. So let's have a quick look at the shifter and handbrake mount as well. We are going to be mounting a VMN shifter and handbrake onto this once we get in and do our driving test. But just to give you a quick overview here, this is another thing which at least at face value looks like it's been pretty greatly improved over what we had with our original TR160. So this is the mount that we had with that. And you can see it's just the plate itself with provision for a whole bunch of different shifters and handbrakes and bits and pieces, just with a couple of bits of metal welded onto it. You can see the quality of the welds wasn't fantastic. It just kind of didn't give you that premium kind of feel when you unboxed it. But the way this worked was it basically just bolted into the profile like so. And then you got four bolts, two on either side. But what we found is that it just worked its way loose over time and would rattle around and move. And it just wasn't a great experience for the money that you were spending. So happy to see at least what looks like some pretty significant improvements here. So you can see two bolts which fix in on the left hand side two bolts which fix in on the right hand side as well. So pretty similar in that regard. We also do have the provision with a couple of extra slots on the inside edge here if you come around this side. So you can actually put two extra bolts in here to give it that extra rigidity if you need to. Now there is a little bit of twist on here still. I can see it does push up and down a bit, but definitely a really, really significant improvement over that original first generation shifter plate that we had with the TR160. And then if we look over on the left hand side here, this is the handbrake mount. So it bolts onto the side of our shifter mount nice and easily, and that can easily slide forward and back like so if you wanna offset the two sides. And again, provision for most of the major manufacturers here. So you shouldn't need to drill new holes unless you've got something very bespoke. And again, you can see countersunk holes here on the left and right. So if you wanted to mount it on the left hand side or the right hand side, no issues in doing so. But we'll get the shifter and handbrake mounted up in just a moment. Let's move on now and take a look at the seat. Okay, so as we covered earlier in the video, we have a couple of different options here when it comes to seats. Track Racer sell a rally style seat. They sell a couple of adjustable back style seats as well, or reclining style. And then we also have the GT fiberglass fixed style seat, which is what we have here. Now we were really impressed with the uh, with the rally seat. So it's gonna be interesting to see how this compares uh, through our testing process. Now already I can see that there's quite a bit of flex going on here. You can see it on the camera yourselves. If I hold on to the top here, to give it sort of like a worst case scenario. So this is the flex in the seat itself. It's the flex induced by the rails, the moving rails as well, all those bits and pieces. But what I wanted to do here is sort of break it down into each component so you can kind of get a picture of what's going on. So what we have here is the track racer seat rails, and then we have our sliding rails or Sparco style seat rails sitting underneath here. And what that allows us to do is just like in a real car, we can pull on the lever underneath the front of the seat and slide our seat forward and back along those rails, lock it into position, and it's good to go. Now, if I move that forward again, if we get the camera in the back here and just kind of rock that seat from side to side, you can see quite a lot of flex between the top half of that rail and the bottom half of the rail. So obviously this part is bolted directly to the rig, so it's not gonna have any flex here. But then as we move the seat from side to side with my hand, you can see the top half kind of rocking back and forth on here. So there is quite a bit of side to side movement there, not too much front to back, but there is some, and will be interesting to see whether that is significant when we're braking in the real world a little bit later on. But you can also see a little bit of side to side movement in the rails themselves here too. So if we completely ignore everything from here down, you can see when I pull on the seat, there is a little bit of twist just kind of in this top portion here as well. So if that bothers you, it is possible to bolt some sort of a strut brace across the bottom here. You could use a piece of profile or something like that. And you can see they've got kind of punched in here along the side, some mitigation for flex here, but would like to see them potentially using some thicker material here just to sort of try and eliminate that a little bit more. You are always gonna get a little bit of flex in seat rails like this, but again, the majority of the flex that we're seeing here is coming 
from these sliding seat rails. So there are obviously a couple of ways around that. You don't have to use these seat rails. They are an optional accessory. You can bolt the side rails directly to the profile. Obviously then you lose the ability to easily slide the seat forward and back. But for me being the only person that ever drives my rig, it's not really a big deal for me. I just have the seat in a fixed position, minimal flex and I'm good to go. And if we actually come over on my P1X cockpit here, which has an RCC seat, now this is an idea that I actually stole from the FGT Elite, which we reviewed recently. Essentially what we have here is those same levers that you saw on the pedal plate for the track racer rig. And what that allows us to do is simply loosen off. So we go like that to loosen. Obviously I'm not gonna do it now because I don't wanna loosen things off, but loosen the seat. And then it allows us to just slide the entire assembly forward and back along these rails without having that additional flex. Now obviously it isn't as convenient to adjust as just pulling a lever underneath your seat. You are gonna need to get off and move things around. So it's not ideal if you're changing drivers all the time, but definitely is better in terms of flex. And you can see here on this particular rig, if I pull that seat from side to side, there's absolutely minimal flex at all. So again, you can take steps to reduce the flex here. If we come back over on the other rig, getting rid of the seat rails is gonna eliminate probably 80 to 90% of it. But then you do still have a little bit of flex in the seat rails themselves. So potentially I could use a thicker material to reduce that even further. But we'll see what it's like when we get up and driving. Now there is a little bit of flex in the seat itself as well. That's something that I did notice. So I'm just gonna slide the seat back again. And if I hold onto the top here, looking straight down. So maybe if Tom comes up here and actually looks straight down with the camera, you can actually see the seat itself does have quite a bit of twist in it. Definitely more so than the rally seat did. And that was something that I noticed. I actually sat in this seat just sitting on the ground so it wasn't, uh, you know, none of the flex inside the rig sort of playing a part. But if I sit in it, I definitely can feel that movement. The most important thing is rigidity from front to back. So obviously when you're slamming on your brake, you don't want to have the seat back moving around. So we'll look at that more once we've got some pedals mounted up. But there definitely is some side to side movement there. If I look down, I can see it flexing around in here. But again, we'll comment on it more when we go for a drive, but there are some steps you can take. It's, it's basically just a balancing act. If you, don't, if you aren't gonna be having multiple different drivers, if you're not gonna be needing to adjust your seating position regularly, then I would definitely recommend don't buy those seat rails. Uh, if you are changing drivers all the time, we showed you that other option, but yeah, it's just gonna be a trade-off either way. Now, I did have genuine Sparco seat rails, which look exactly the same as these on my P1X originally. They did still have a little bit of flex in them, not quite as much as we have here, but it could just be a luck of the draw type thing. I'm pretty confident that all of these seat rails actually come out of the same factory. These looked absolutely identical to the genuine Sparco ones, which I bought with the P1X. So yeah, this seat definitely does have more inherent flex in the chassis itself or in the shell itself than the rally seat did. So yeah, I'm not sure how I'm gonna feel about that until I go for a drive. Let me jump out again quickly now. And uh, yeah, let's just talk quickly about comfort and things like that. So it is actually really nice. It's not the, you know, it's not the most heavily padded thing in the world, but it, it feels relatively comfortable sitting in it. We do also have the provision for a five point harness too. So if we lift that up, you can see we've got the pass through there. We've got pass throughs on the side. So you've got your two shoulder straps, your two points coming in from the sides and then your fifth point through the base there. So you can run a five point if you wish to do so. We've got plenty of padding here in the back as well and that is removable so you can take it out and wash it if you need to which is obviously a good thing. Uh, nice quality embroidery throughout here as well. I don't see any bad stitching or anything like that. A nice quality material as well feels relatively plush. Good amount of padding in the sides as well but not so soft that it's you know just ridiculous. One thing I did notice is that there's quite a bit of rustling in the sides here. Let me just do this on microphone so you can hear it. So it's almost like they've got some sort of a plastic kind of style foam inside there, which does make quite a bit of noise. So we'll see whether I hear that when I'm driving a bit later on too, but I'm nitpicking here, but it's important that we point all these things out. But look, we've got the nice quality suede on the sides here too for the side bolsters where we climb in and out. Obviously we can't comment on wear and tear on those just yet, but they have a nice feel to them. And look, overall, other than that uh, somewhat excessive flex in the sides, I would say, it's, you know, it seems like a pretty decent high quality seat. The back here has got the Track Racer logo on it too. And you can see the rest of the back here is all just a hard shell. Then on the sides, we've got our mounting points to bolt into our seat rails, simple as that. So let's get our pedals mounted on the rig now. We'll get the handbrake and shifter mounted up as well. 
and see how this thing performs in the real world. Okay, so we've got the basic components that most people are gonna have on their SIM rig set up now. Uh, we haven't done any cable management or anything like that. We'll cover that a little later on, but we've got the Husingville Ultimate Plus pedals mounted up on here. And we've intentionally picked some pedals which have a nice solid load cell. So we're gonna be putting a lot of force in and really testing that pedal plate. Also pick pedals which are bolted directly to the profile as you can see down there. That makes things a little bit better for just testing this pedal plate on its own without any other ancillary components which would distort the overall uh, result that we get with the pedal itself. So that's good. Uh, then we have the VMN shifter and handbrake mounted here as well and our DD2. So let's start off with the pedals. I really like the design of this pedal plate. It's definitely a massive improvement as I mentioned before over the previous generation or the previous model that we looked at with the, uh, with the TR160 previously. And remembering again that this is now an option for the TR160 as well. So you can bolt any pedal plate directly on top of the profile here, but I really like the integrated heel plate design here. Plenty of adjustability there. You can mount the pedals laterally however you want as well, so you can put whatever spacing you desire. And most importantly, there's very, very, very little flex there at all. So as I push that down, there's a tiny little bit of dip, but I would say that is on par with the experience with the P1X, maybe a tiny, tiny, tiny bit more flex. But there I'm putting in probably about 100 kilograms of force, really pushing in hard. And yeah, very minimal amount of flex. So you'll see it on camera, but certainly not enough that I would notice it when I'm driving, I don't think, and certainly not enough that it would be detrimental to the driving experience. Here's some adjustability in terms of angle as well. You can see I've actually tilted the angle of the pedals slightly away from me there to give me the tilt that I want on the pedal faces themselves. So I was very easily able to do that just by loosening the four bolts that we looked at before and then just tilting the whole assembly up. So yeah, plenty of adjustability there. Really, really happy with that design. Definitely a huge improvement over what we've looked at previously from track races. So really happy to see that. So shift amount, I'm happy with the design. Remember, we do have a couple of different options available here. We've got the option of just a short piece of profile which we can bolt directly onto our upright and mount the shifter with this bracket on top of that. Or we have the option as we have here with the arm um, and then the support bar down here. Now, with the shifter as it is now, there's a little bit of flex when I pull it towards me. When I pull the lever towards me like that, you can see, actually I need to tighten that a little bit too, there we go. You can see it does pull in ever so slightly, but certainly not something that I'd notice when I'm just slamming away. You can see there's a little bit of vibration there, a little bit of resonance. But yeah, I don't think that that's enough that it's gonna bother anybody. If it does bother you, you can of course get creative and find ways to bot whatever shifter you have directly to the profile. But you know, most of that wobble there, if you actually look down on it, is coming from the arm itself rather than this assembly here. So this is mounted pretty solidly to the profile, but you can see when I wobble it from side to side, there is a little bit of rattle, a little bit of shake in here. And that's just, you know, the design. It's certainly not something that's specific to this particular cockpit, every aluminium profile with a arm um, of this style is gonna have the same kind of amount of flex there. And I do like that they do have that reinforcement plate there. I think that does make a difference. So that's all good. The handbrake mount, I'm a little bit less impressed with, I'll be honest with you. First issue is that it's way too far away. Now we do have it mounted uh, with the mounting holes that are provided for the VMN uh, handbrake. Obviously, depending on what kind of handbrake you're mounting here, the experience will vary. But this particular configuration, you can see as I'm driving, that is quite a reach away from me. So if I was slamming away in a rally car, I'd want the handbrake kind of just here so I could just pull it very quickly. Whereas, you know, reaching across like that every time is you know quite awkward and it just doesn't really work. Now, the other big thing here that you'll notice is the amount of flex that we're getting in that arm, just because of the leverage that we have pulling something towards us from that far away. Now, this particular shifter and the way it mounts here does, I guess, exacerbate the issue to some extent. If you had a shifter which mounted on an angle, it would be less. But, you know, just naturally this sits too far away from me. Now you could of course remove this and mount it directly onto the profile here, but then it's gonna kind of be awkward too. So I think in this case, what I'm gonna do is use the other option which is available from Track Racer, get a couple of angle brackets to kind of put that about here. Then we can mount our handbrake directly to the profile here. That's gonna place it right next to my steering wheel where it's nice and easy to reach. And it's also not gonna get in the way of my shifter, which I do actually like the position of. That's quite comfortable there. So I guess the important thing here is that between the various different options which are available from Track Racer, you are gonna find a solution that's gonna work regardless of what kind of shifter or handbrake you have. I can't think of many exceptions to that. Often one of the things that can be quite problematic is when you buy an off the shelf style aluminum profile cockpit, unless you have an abundance of spare parts and bits and pieces laying around that you can 
can kind of use to fabricate things yourself. You are kind of limited with the, I guess, the things that they kind of thought of out of the box. So it is good to see they have various options available there, which should suit most people. But yeah, definitely for this particular handbrake, mounting it there is gonna make a lot more sense. And I think that's gonna be the same for the majority of handbrakes that are out there. I, I can't see many reasons why you would wanna have a handbrake mounted out on a bracket here so far away from you, even if you could angle it towards you. It's just kind of awkward, so yeah. It is what it is. But let us know in the comments what kind of solutions you guys have come up with. Now let's look at the wheel deck. This is one of the things that I really like about the cockpit as well. There's quite a few things that I really like about this cockpit. I'm very impressed with it so far. So plenty of adjustment available here. We can move the whole deck forward and back to accommodate the ideal seating position. Now if you are wondering about seating position and posture, we have a dedicated video where we went through all the essentials for setting up a cockpit and getting your seating position correct. So just to quickly run over it, you wanna have enough angle in your legs so that your thighs aren't pinched off against the seat. So you don't wanna be cutting off circulation. You wanna be pushing your brake and your throttle pedal from your thigh, not your ankle. So you don't wanna be going like that. You wanna be kind of pushing from your legs. So you wanna have enough scope of movement in your leg that you're not maxing out the stroke. So you don't wanna be kind of pushing like that. Uh, you definitely don't wanna have your legs resting up against the seat either. So a little bit of elevation there, making sure that you have your pedals high enough to facilitate that. And then in terms of wheel height, if you rest your arms straight from your shoulder, on top of the wheel, your wrist should be resting on top of the wheel and your wrist should be about eye level. So if you've got all that right, you should be pretty much good to go. But look, in terms of the wheel deck, one of the things we always test is flex. And if I pull up and down on that, you can see the flex inherent in the Fnatic wheelbase design, which we've spoken about before. But in terms of flex in the wheel deck itself, I can pull on that as hard as I dare without snapping the pins on the wheel and yeah, there's no flex in that at all. So I'm very, very happy with that design. I don't see any issues there at all. The only thing that I maybe would change about this design is if we have a look at something like the SimCore wheel mount, you'll notice that it has the 40 by 160 profile on its side rather than upright. If you are in a position where you have screens mounted behind your rig, so sitting down below the wheelbase, obviously having the profile like this is gonna block out the view of those screens. So this particular design does lend itself to having the screens mounted above the wheel rather than behind it. Not gonna be a problem for the majority of people. That's just something that I would personally change for my particular implementation because I have the giant screens, which I like to have sitting down nice and low. But this does give the option of mounting all kinds of bits and pieces very cleanly right in front of you here. So button boxes, you know, any all kinds of mounts, emergency stop buttons, all those kinds of things you can just bolt directly onto the profile here. So yeah, really happy with this design in terms of flex and adjustability. Absolutely no problems there whatsoever, which certainly can't be said for some of the previous generation track racer front mount wheel plates that we've seen in the past. So again, really happy to see that improvement there. I do really like the anodized red aluminium there too. It's quite a cool look. So yeah, subjective thing, but you know, it's nice to see that little attention to detail. And one of the other things that I like about this design is because the overall mount stays the same and it's just the part that holds the wheelbase, which changes the amount of flex that you have is pretty much uniform across all types of wheelbases that you might be mounting. So if you're mounting something which is bottom mounted, you can use this guy here. Obviously you will need to drop the whole assembly a little bit lower, which may become a problem with your knees. But again, that's just going to depend on your body shape. And then we also have the front mount for the SimiCube style wheelbases as well. They all mount in from the side here exactly the same as what we have so the amount of flex that you have is pretty much exactly the same across all of them but the weak point here for me is the gt style fiberglass fixed seat now the reason i say that is that there is quite a bit of flex in the back of the seat itself now i am a relatively heavy breaker i break at around sort of 60 to 80 kilograms a lot of people break a lot lighter than that so this certainly isn't going to be an issue for everybody but if you are a heavy breaker like me this is definitely something that you want to be aware of at least now if i push on my brake pedal you can see there is a little bit of forward to back movement, as I mentioned before, not enough that it's gonna bother me, but what's happening is when I brake to 100%, bang, you can see the back of the seat is actually bulging out there. So it gives you a massive kind of clunk through the seat as you're braking and it takes all the fidelity of the braking away from you. Anything that changes as you're braking is gonna you know, change the amount of pressure that you're putting on the pedal. And that to me is, you know, that's, that's a pretty big design issue. Again, if you're, if you're a lighter breaker than me, it's not gonna be a problem for you. So I'm certainly not saying don't buy this seat. I'm just saying, you know, if you are a heavy breaker, this is definitely something that you'll wanna consider. Now, the, the rally style seat, 
from Track Racer, the fixed back one. We haven't tested the recliner ones. Uh, that was a really good seat. Didn't have any issues with that at all. I was very, very happy with it. In fact, quite impressed with it. So I would definitely choose the rally style seat over this one if you are a heavy breaker. So your experience may vary with this. Track Racer might want to send us out a replacement seat and see whether we have the same issue. But for me, at least that is an absolute deal breaker. There's no way I would run a seat that does that on my daily driver rig because it just takes all the fidelity out of the braking. And it is as simple as that. But look, otherwise, very, very happy with the cockpit itself. I think the TR120 is excellent so far. So I think the next thing to do now is get everything up and running. We'll uh, have a look at the cable management too, and then come back with my final conclusions. So driving test wise, we put it through its paces with GT style driving as well as some rally to test out the handbrake and shifter, and kind of a bit more chaotic kind of movement in the rig in general. And look, honestly, I'm really impressed with it overall. The pedal plate in particular feels very, very solid. No dramas at all there with flex. Wheel deck feels very solid as well. There was no movement there. And really just, you know, all in all, just driving around in GT style, it felt a very, very solid rig. Didn't feel any different really from the experience that I have in my Simlabs P1X with a lot of the modifications that we've made to solidify things over time included in that comparison as well. So I've got to say for the price, the TR120 is a very impressive piece of kit. And even with really high-end pedals like what we have on here with the Husingville Ultimate Plus pedals, it really stands up to it. Absolutely no issues with creaking or groaning. Didn't discern any flex in the base of the chassis either in those joints. Obviously that's something that we'll revisit a little bit later on once we do some motion testing as well. But overall, in terms of the pedal and wheel deck, very, very impressed with how solid and flex-free everything is. Now, the seat was where things sort of started to fall apart for me in the overall experience. So whether it was GT or rally style driving, I did find that through sharp corners with my force feedback turned up quite strong. So around sort of 12, 15 Newton meters with the DD2, I was feeling the seat flexing from side to side quite a bit, more so than I have with the seat that I run on my daily drive rig. Now remember, this seat is a $300 seat and you know I'm comparing it to experiences with far more expensive seats. But having said that, the rally style seat from Track Racer doesn't move around anywhere near as much as this one does. So that's talking about the seat itself and of course Course, we did also have the problem with the back of the seat kind of popping out under high force braking. Now again I am braking between sort of 70 to 80 kilograms most of the time in the kind of GT style racing games. I didn't find that that was happening in the rally style so much but definitely something to consider if you are a heavy footed braker like me or you are planning on running high end pedals. Obviously if you're running something like Fnatic V3s or even HE Sprint it's probably not going to be an issue and while there wasn't a heap of front to back movement that back of the seat popping out definitely did pull away from the immersion and the consistency when it came to braking. Now in terms of the mounting of the seat, there is still that side to side movement in the rails themselves. 90% of that does come from the adjustable seat rails. So if you don't need that, if you don't need to be able to slide your seat back and forth, I would definitely recommend don't worry about spending the money on those. If you can get your seat in a fixed position, you are gonna be more solid. Obviously the more moving parts you have, the more tricky it becomes to sort of have minimal movement. And I think that's a pretty universal experience with sliding seat rails on most sim rigs. At least all the ones that I've tested have all had that little bit of movement there. So not really a nitpick of the TR120 specifically there, but I do feel like the side mounts for the seat where the seat actually bolts to those rails does still have a little bit too much side to side flex there. And I would like to see them use some thicker material there just to minimize that. And I think if the rest of the rig was flexing and moving around, it probably wouldn't be so noticeable, but because the rest of the rig is so well made and is so solid, it really did just kind of highlight some of those weaknesses in the seat. But what we'll do is use this rig to test out a couple of other seats, which we have in for review as well. And we'll see what kind of difference it makes there. So make sure you subscribe so you can check out those future reviews where you can compare this chair to some of the others that we have in the studio. Now, in terms of the handbrake and shifter, obviously the experience here will vary depending on the kind of hardware that you have mounted. We have the VNM handbrake and shifter mounted. And as you saw earlier in the video, when we were using the handbrake mount off to the side of the shifter, that did have a whole ton of flex in it. Happy to report that when we use the mounting profile that comes directly off the wheel deck as one of the options that's available from Track Racer directly, mounted the handbrake directly to that. Absolutely no flex there whatsoever, no problems at all. And happy with the amount of flex that we have in the shifter as well. You can see it moving around a little bit in the footage. You will see it kind of moving towards me when I pull it hard, but definitely not enough to really take away from the experience and not something that I noticed at all when I was driving. Long of a crest. It's a six right long, Titan's cut to gravel.
So conclusions on the Track Racer TR120 cockpit and fixed GT style seat. So let's start off with the cockpit. Look, overall, very impressed with this product. It's definitely surprised me. I did have quite a few complaints about the TR160 when we reviewed that 18 months ago. Track Racer have been communicating with me since that time and sort of keeping me up to date with a lot of the improvements that they made, not only in the experience of putting it together with documentation, but also in the quality of the hardware in that time as well. So I'm really happy to be able to report to you guys that we can definitely see a lot of those improvements that have been made over time, particularly when it comes to the rigidity of the wheel deck with the new wheel deck designs and the pedal plate. Those are definitely a massive step forward from the ones that we reviewed with the TR160 a while back. Remembering that these are both compatible with the TR160 as well. So definitely happy to see those things. In terms of the TR120 cockpit itself as well, perfectly fine and rigid, didn't have any problems at all with the base of the chassis flexing or twisting. And obviously we will revisit that when we get into testing some motion a little bit down the track. We have a couple of different motion systems which we're going to be using with this rig. And I think this rig will probably actually become our test rig here in the studio. We can test various different bits of hardware. So it will get put through its paces over time. We will let you know if we run into any issues. But we didn't have any issues with squeaks or groans or anything like that. No problems with anything moving around. And yeah, just overall a very, very solid cockpit. I guess the only real weakness there was when it came to the seat. Now we talked a little bit before about sliding seat rails and how they do tend to be a bit of a trade-off with any sim rig. I had one on my Simlabs P1X originally, ended up taking it off just because I wanted to dial out that last little bit of flex in the seat that I had mounted. So it is a bit of a trade off there. If you are needing to constantly move the position of your seat forward and back, it is something that you're probably gonna wanna buy and you're just gonna kinda have to deal with that little bit of flex that it does introduce. But if you don't need to move your seating position often, if you're the only person driving your rig, then I would recommend don't worry about spending the money on that sliding seat rail and just bolt your seat mount directly to those profile pieces. That will give you the best experience there. Now while we're on the subject of flex in the seat, one thing that I did notice was that there is a little bit of side to side movement in the mounting brackets themselves for the seat. So removing the seat from the equation entirely, regardless of the seat that you mount, you will experience a little bit of side to side movement in those brackets. And look, it probably wouldn't even be noticeable if it wasn't for the fact that the rest of the rig is so solid, but definitely the one point of contact, you've got your point of contact with your feet, your bottom and your hands. And that is the one area where I did feel movement, whereas my feet and my hands were absolutely solid, no movement there whatsoever. So we'll finish off talking about the bits and pieces related to the TR120 cockpit specifically first, and we'll come back to the fixed back GT style seat. So handbrake and shifter, as you saw earlier in the video, we did start off with the side mounted bracket for the handbrake. Did find that there was excessive flex in that. Not only that, but it did tend to sort of sit a little bit too far away to really be comfortable. So I would recommend, again, depending on the type of shifter and handbrake that you have, obviously some handbrakes can mount directly to shifters and so forth. So think about what you're doing. Don't You don't necessarily need to order all those parts immediately. If you have a handbrake or shifter that can mount directly to the profile, that generally is the better option because you're removing more opportunities for flex there. But again, it will depend on the hardware that you have. But we did find that that handbrake was just a little bit too far away with that mounting bracket and that did cause quite a lot of flex just with the leverage that it created. So what we ended up doing was mounting the shifter directly on the shifter mount and then using the other option available from Track Racer to mount the handbrake directly to the wheel deck upright with a piece of profile. And that actually ended up working really well. Absolutely no discernible flex in the handbrake at all and just a tiny little bit in the shifter which really wasn't noticeable at all when driving. So really not even something that I think is worthy of nitpicking, but it is there. It's a tiny little bit of flex, but it is there. And otherwise, I think the other important thing to highlight here is just the experience of putting the rig together. Cable management was nice and easy. They included some little clips there and some cable ties, which made that simple. We did have a missing box and a couple of missing bolts and pieces inside one of the boxes as well. So we did end up having to hold the build and wait for those additional pieces to come. Once that was all sorted though, everything was fine. The instructions were really easy to follow as well. Definitely some significant improvements there from 18 months ago when we reviewed the TR160. So that was great to see as well. And just overall an enjoyable experience putting this together. And I guess we just kind of felt confident with the build the whole way through. We felt like we knew what we were doing. And even though we have built a few of these before, I don't think anybody's gonna have any problem putting one of these together. It really isn't all that daunting if you just take your time and follow through the instructions. And make sure you do check out that video we mentioned earlier for our best practices, tips and tricks for putting together an aluminum profile cockpit. Definitely save you some time and frustration there. But overall, I think the TR120 is a very solid product, particularly at the price point. Comparing it to the FGT Elite, for example, there is more flex in the pedal plate and the wheel deck on the FGT Elite than what we have here. So that is definitely something worth considering. And I'm really happy that we have an option like this available here in Australia. It doesn't cost a fortune to ship within the country. 
And really it's as simple as that. I think the TR120 is a really good product for the price. So moving on to the GT style fixed back fiberglass seat. Now this was definitely the weaker point of this review overall. The one thing that I was probably a little bit more disappointed in. So removing the flex that we discussed before in the seat rails and the slider, there is quite a bit of twist in the seat itself. You notice it in your back. If you move your shoulders from side to side, the whole thing kind of twists from side to side more than I've experienced with any other seat that I've tested in the past. So it isn't an expensive seat by any means, but even for that price, I have tested other seats that I think are better quality than this one, including the uh, the Track Racer Rally Style seat, which I was actually really impressed with. So I'd say that was probably part of the reason why I was disappointed with this particular seat, because I was comparing it to the experience I had with the Rally seat, and that was far better in every regard. In particular, the main issue that I have with this seat is when you push in on the brake, the back does pop out and you get a lot of movement in the back of your seat. And that just takes away from the fidelity in the braking and definitely will impact things like muscle memory and consistency there. So if you're a lighter braker, and I didn't have issues when I was doing rally style driving, but if you are a lighter braker, if you're running something like Fanatec V3s or maybe Husingvolt Sprint, something like that, you may not have issues here, but anything heavier than that, or if you're a heavy footed braker like me, then I wouldn't recommend this seat simply because that flex is a deal breaker, at least in my experience. Now, we'll wait to see what they have to say about that. Maybe we just got a bad one. Maybe they'll want to send us out a replacement. And if they do, we're definitely happy to test it out and give you guys an update, but I have to review what I have here in front of me. And unfortunately that is the experience. So I would definitely recommend check out the rally style seat. That was a really impressive option, but yeah, although it is a comfortable seat and the build quality in terms of materials is good, it definitely needs to be a lot more rigid than it is, at least in my opinion. So overall TR120, excellent product seat, not so good, but I really hope that this review has helped you guys out. And I'm really happy to see that track racer have taken some big steps forward in the time between when we review the TR160 18 months ago and the TR120 now and hopefully they can continue to push things forward and keep on improving their products into the future because that helps everybody. So if you decide you want to pick up one of these things that we've checked out today, there are some links down in the description. They are a great way of helping out supporting the channel. So thank you very much for your support there. But above all, as always, thank you so much for watching guys. As I said before, we will be reviewing a few other products, including some motion products with this cockpit. So make sure you sub so you don't miss out on those. Thanks very much for watching guys and I will see you again in the next one. Bye.